Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. I'm your host, Rob Moore. Podcasting here, as always, from the Grand Avenue location, Bucket Works, in the mall, beautiful downtown Milwaukee. With me, as always, Brian Edwards. What do you got to say, Brian? Hey, I'm excited to be here. It's a big night. we got a big name with us tonight, a big hitter, a big player. He's an atheist activist, author, public speaker, blogger. He's a trained historian and one of the leading current proponents of the Christ myth theory. He received a Ph.D. in ancient history from Columbia University in 08, and he's published several articles and chapters in books on the subject of history and philosophy. He's the author of the books Proving History and On the Historicity of Jesus. He is also an advocate of atheism and metaphysical naturalism, which he has defended in his book Sense and Goodness Without God. We are very, very pleased to have with us, maybe in my view, I guess, my limited newcomer's view to the... uh, to the scene, the leading mythicist, Dr. Richard Carrier. What's up, doctor? Hi. Nice to be here. Thanks for Thanks joining going us. well over here. Yeah. Good deal. You got sunlight still here in the spring? It's Stockton, California, illuminated? Must be earlier than here. It, it, yeah, it is. Um, I'd say the sun's about to go down. It's, it's on its way. It's getting dark. Wow. Uh, tell me about... Uh, about Richard Carrier, I'm a uh, I'm, I'm a newcomer. I'm a I'm a talking head and an atheist here locally. I'm a new to the mythicist scene, and ah. it's fascinating to me. Uh, and as far as a, a, you know, someone who's looking at it from the outside, it looks like you're uh, you're the guy along with a couple of other of other folks. Do you have a sense of that? Tell me where you see your place in the secular world. Um, well, I, I have plug into a lot of different aspects of the movement. I, I don't just do the one thing. Um, right now, of course, I'm promoting my book on the historicity of Jesus, and that has kind of put me at the forefront of the Jesus myth theory in terms of really pushing its attention in serious academia. Um, so it's it's been a thing uh, in, in you know in, in in the public and in the popular spheres online and and uh, amateur writing and things like that, but. No one had really tried to make a push to get this argument through peer review at an academic press, get academic associations looking at it, and, and start creating a dialogue at that level. And so I've really been doing that. Um, although I was inspired to do it by my fans who actually uh, got together a research grant to really push me to do this. So that, I mean, that, that was six years ago, and that's resulted in the two books that you mentioned on the subject, Proving History and On the Historicity of Jesus. And so, uh, and so that's one side of my life. Um, but I also do lots of other aspects of ancient history, um, you know, counter apologetics, ancient science. I've done a lot on that. Um, and also, I do stuff in contemporary philosophy of naturalism, uh, you know, ob- objective moral ethics for atheism, meta ethics, epistemology, various aspects of contemporary naturalist and atheist philosophy. And on top of that, I'm also involved in some of the social justice side of things as, as a feminist and a polyamory advocate and things like that. So I've, I've been involved in a lot of different aspects of the atheism movement in different respects in different ways. As a lot of us are, I think, is, uh, in my experience, there's only a few of us uh, in each local area doing what we do, and so we kind of wear a lot of different hats. Uh, mythicism, sure, yeah. mythicism being pretty new uh, uh, on the scene. What's uh, what's your take on um, its its foothold? Is it is it gaining any momentum? Is it is it to, to us? It seems like it's it's a big deal, but is it really just a fringe thing? Is it really is it what it was it what is yeah. its viability? I guess. Well, let, let just the fact that you call it a new thing is indica- indicative of the fact that it's gaining traction. I mean, because it, it's not really a new thing. It's been around for almost a hundred years. Um, it, it just was very low key. It was about the 80s and early 90s that certain publications, certain authors like G. A. Wells and Robert Price, started more popularizing it a little bit more. But even then, it was only sort of a, a rarefied corner, mostly of the secular movement that was aware of this going on. Uh, and but it has been like the last 10 years that it has gained more and more public attention to the point that that there are articles on it by Valerie Tarico and Raphael Batasker that made that basically went viral through a lot of online, major online media, like Huffington Post and things like that, was were covering it or talking about it in, in different areas. So uh, it's getting attention. Um, and this, of course, is annoying certain powers that be that don't like this, uh, and so they, they, there's pushback from them as well. But at the same time, there's been my academic work to try and prevent them from actually denouncing it as amateur. Um, they can't really dismiss it anymore based on that argument, as they used to do. And even though there are, in fact, a lot of cranks 
like full on tinfoil hat arguments for the, the mysticism of Jesus. So they do have some viable targets. So it's very easy for them to just conflate all of us or all of the arguments and just say, well, look at how ridiculous Joseph Atwill is, let's say. Therefore, Jesus mysticism is ridiculous. But, but that's, that's a, a fallacious way to argue. But that, it does make it difficult for uh, serious academics like myself and Price uh, and Thomas Thompson and Thomas Brody and others to try and get academics to take this seriously and look at the non-crank, non-tinfoil hat versions of this argument. You mentioned that uh, your book is um, peer-reviewed, and generally I, I relate that to journals. It, can I, so I have a question. It, mm-hmm. do, do books receive peer review, and how is yeah. that peer review process going? Are you running into any trial b- problems even in academia regarding your peer review of this topic that you know, can ruffle feathers sometimes? Yeah, not, not this one per se. Uh, peer review can be problematic in a lot of ways because a lot of people have access to grind it, well outside of this subject, in all subjects in history. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it can be very difficult to get through peer review because your, your peer reviewers won't be fair to you. I know, I know, I mean, I'm sure every single historian in every single field has stories to tell about unfair and biased peer review process they've had to deal with. Um, but uh, in history, yeah, for academic press books, if it's a university press, uh, they generally, now maybe they make exceptions, I don't know, for, for big hitter, big money books, I'm not sure, but certainly for the bulk of their academic monographs, their basic academic books, those books get fully peer-reviewed. They usually have multiple peer reviewers who read the books uh, and then basically write to the editor saying, well, I think these things are wrong with it, and if you can fix these things, we'll publish it. Or they'll say this is completely crazy and they haven't done even the most rudimentary basic work, so you shouldn't even bother with it. So it's usually something like that. Uh, so every time you submit a book for academic peer review, you will get peer review reports back that say, well, we had problems with certain aspects of this, but we think they're all fixable. Here's the things you would have to do for this to meet our academic standards. And that's typical. Uh, and usually you can meet all of those requirements, and then you get through peer review, and that's no problem. And the whole point of that process is to make sure that it isn't crank and tinfoil hat, uh, is to make sure that you're at least meeting the minimum standards of what they expect from someone arguing in that field, like, do you really know what you're talking about? Have you overlooked glaring facts that, that really undermine your thesis? Have you, uh, do you argue soundly? Do you, or do you thoroughly cite your evidence and scholarship and so on? Um, so that those, all those kinds of standards are being met, and peer review makes sure that they're, they're being met that way, which is why a lot of people will attack certain arguments for not being peer reviewed. It's like, oh, why should we, that's not even a peer reviewed article, why should we pay attention to it? But then, of course, you go and get the peer reviewed article, go past this peer review, and now they're like attacking peer review as being irrelevant. So you <laughs> often find people uh, are very disingenuous uh, in their uh, citation of peer review. Um, but it does matter. Uh, and so a lot of people do prick up their ears and t- pay more attention when you get something like this passed through academic peer review, especially at a university press that is a renowned publisher of biblical studies scholarship. Uh, so so this, wasn't, this wasn't a minor thing. Who are some of these cranks that are making it difficult for uh, the movement to be taken seriously? Well, I mentioned, I mentioned Joseph Atwill, of course. Uh, Joseph Atwill uh, is a guy who apparently made tons of money in the 90s in the stock market or something. And um, he's basically, in my opinion, literally crazy. Um, I mean, that's not a clinical judgment. That's just my, from my experience. And he advocates really ridiculous conspiracy theory, tea leaf reading style arguments where he claims that the entire New Testament was forged by Josephus at the behest of the Roman emperor Titus in order to pacify the Jews. That it was some big conspiracy. It was completely invented by the Roman political elite. Um, this thing is absurd on, on so many levels, just, even just on basic context of prior probabilities and common sense, but even on, on its facts. Um, it does not appear that Joseph Atwill can even read Greek, for example, and yet all his <laughs> arguments depend his arguments depend on statistical anomalies and, and coincidences in the Greek, but you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't read Greek. And I've caught him on errors based on this. I, I have a whole blog article for people who are interested called um, Atwill's Cranked Up Jesus. Uh, you can Google that and find my discussion of why why this is baloney. Okay. So s- since um, s- yeah. since some of these some of these mythicists are uh, are making it difficult uh, based on maybe conflicting evidence or uh, you know not not uh, not properly researched, those on the other side have virtually no evidence. How is it that they are able to cast any stones at all? The, the, <laughs> you mean the history the, that you defend? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, of course, it's the traditional socially acceptable position. Right. So you can say almost any absurd, ridiculous thing, and no one's going to call you out on it. Uh, because it, it starts as the default not being crank. Um, so everybody just assumes, oh, that must be true, until then you check it, and you go, well, hold on, everything they said is false or misleading or inaccurate. Um, so you do run into that a lot. Um, and even, surprisingly, even from professionals in the field, often will make egregious mistakes or egregiously misrepresent the evidence, uh, or, or use really bizarre, illogical methodologies to try and get the conclusion they want, um, right. which is disturbing. And, th and that was one of the points proving history, my, my first book in this series, illustrated, and many other scholars had been observing this and written books and articles about it as well. I'm not the first one to notice it, uh, but I documented extensively in there. Um, so it's an example of this kind of problem. And I, But I do think it is that institutional inertia. Uh, also, all the money is tied, to, uh, tied in with Christian institutions. So uh, I find, for example, in Bart Ehrman's latest book, he has an extremely elaborate, illogical, convoluted methodology in terms of his philosophy of history that he puts in there just to make it possible for him to not offend the Christians too much and still make the arguments that he wants to make. And I, I really see there like, uh, oh, he doesn't want his money to dry up. He doesn't want grants. He doesn't want people to stop buying his books. Sure. Uh, even academic positions can in a way be influenced by Christians who are making decisions. So in biblical studies, it is difficult to make a good career basically burning all the bridges of Christian faith yeah. doctrine. I mean, so, it, if there um, was still a market for buggy whips, um, you know, you, you, there would be somebody making them. So yeah, definitely, I think <laughs> you know that the, the, you, your point is taken on 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 its cells, and that that can can affect. But but you know, we'll stipulate, and that's that's what's great about um, your peer reviewed status on the book. Um, I wanted to kind of get into maybe some of the meat of this. Um, like for example, I've I've heard that that um, Paul's Jesus is different than other Jesuses, and that maybe even in the book of Zechariah, um, we, we see a reference to more Paul's Jesus, because he would have had access to that Old Testament book, you know, that, that the Jesus of the mm -hmm. Gospels is different. Can you, is Paul's Jesus related to the book of Zechariah, or, or am I just kind of well, grabbing on I mean, the I, fleeting connection? Yeah, no, no, I, I suspect so. We can't prove that directly. Um, so I, I wouldn't use it as a component in an argument for a conclusion. Um, it's just something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it wouldn't just be Zechariah. Zechariah 3 and Zechariah 6 would be the chapters that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they would, the Christians would have, and I talk about this in On the Historicity of Jesus. I cite the scholarship for the Jewish precedents and stuff for all of this, called the Pesherim, which is a Pesher literature genre. Uh, we, see, we have lots of examples in the Dead Sea Scrolls of this, where Jews were looking at the Old Testament by finding mixed up passages from different books and seeing them all as being about the same secret message, the same person or the same story or the same event. And so they're piecing together their, their narratives, their, their idea of what God's plan is and what, what the prophecies for the future are by assembling different verses from different scriptures, uh, basically. Mm -hmm. so, so they would look at, for example, let's say, Hypothetically, they would see Zechariah 3 and 6 uh, talking about a son of God, Jehovah the Righteous, um, and named Jesus, who is crowned in heaven uh, and is going to, you know, uh, basically affect an eternal atonement for sins. And you see other passages that talk about uh, a final, a, a chosen one of God affecting a final atonement of sins. You see that, and through his death even, and you see that in Isaiah 52 and 53. You see that in Daniel 9, uh, and then extended by Daniel 12. You see it in the Wisdom of Solomon 2 and 5. And so you can see all of these different verses. You can easily look at them and say, oh, these must be talking about the same guy, because they're talking about this dying and rising chosen one of God who's going to solve all problems in the future. And if you do that, you can actually construct the entire Christian gospel just by doing that. You don't need history, you don't need the gospels, you don't need any of that. And, and I show this in On the Historicity of Jesus. It's so easy to do that it's conspicuous, in fact. Now, uh, we can't prove that's what Paul was doing, but it looks like that's what Paul was doing. Uh, or if not Paul, then the Christians before him, because of course he inherited a Christian theology before him. He didn't invent Christianity himself, he just modified it. But, uh, so, so it does make a lot of sense that that's what's going on. And what we do see in Paul, though, is his 
his Jesus. And you see this in Romans 16, verses 25 to 26. You see it in, in other places as well. Paul only knows of a revelatory Christ about whom you only know facts by reading the scriptures. And he says, you know, that the teaching of Jesus, you only know from revelation and from scripture. That's, that's Romans 16. So it looks like that's what's going on, uh, that it's visions and dreams mm-hmm. combined with these Pesher-like readings of scriptures. This idea of a guy who had a ministry in Galilee appears decades and decades later, and, it's, and, and really it, it gets created by the Gospel of Mark, because all the other versions of the story are just redactions of Mark in one fashion or another. So there's really only one origin point for this myth, and that's Mark, who wrote after the 70 A.D. Uh, destruction of Jerusalem, mm-hmm. um, possibly possibly more than a decade after that, for all we know. Uh, so, you know, that when you see it in those terms, the, the Jesus and Paul does not look a lot like the Jesus Mark is writing about, although the teachings that Mark characterizes in the Gospel are those of Paul. So he's very much a, he's part of the Pauline sect, so he's sort of mythologizing Paul's doctrines by creating this character of Jesus and having him walk around Galilee preaching these things. So, so you can explain the, the progression that way. So he had, Paul had a, a very, very deeply fundamental impact on the direction of Christianity, as picked up by the gospel writers. Yes, well, uh, as picked up by Mark. When you look at Matthew, Matthew was written by a sect of Christians that was still Torah observant. So in fact, they were an anti-Paul sect. And so they didn't like Mark's gospel because it was too pro-Paul, so they rewrote it. And they rewrote a version of it that had Jesus declare that you basically you had to become a Jew to be a Christian. So the gospel of Matthew is very much an argument against Mark. It's supposed to erase Mark and replace it with what they think is the true ideology. So you have these two competing sects. You have the original Torah-observant Christian sect, and then you have Paul's deviation from that, which was the, the Gentile-allowing sect. Paul's church was way more successful because there were far more Gentiles you could bring into the church than you could get Jews into the other church. So Paul's church became much more prolific, had many more voices, had a lot more money coming in. So his church was much more successful. And, and, and so that's the reality of what was going on. So give us an idea, like perspective, and, and quote me if I get the numbers wrong. The Paul's writing mm-hmm. around 50 to 55 A.D., I mean, how big is, is Christianity, I mean, at that time? You said that he had funding yeah. and people. I mean, how, how, how many followers does he have? And what's yeah, the makeup? Um, Are they rich, poor? Well, diverse. Uh, there's, a, I mean, the, certainly his, the authentic letters of Paul, there's seven that we agree are authentic. The others are forgeries. Um, those letters of Paul were written in the 50s, and we can tell that from internal evidence. We don't have to rely on the book of Acts, which few scholars believe is reliable anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but the just internal evidence in Paul's letters, you can, you can see that they're occurring somewhere around the 50s AD. Now, uh, the interesting thing with that is that these letters show that uh, Christianity for Paul, Paul's churches, extend across two continents. He's got churches, uh, not his own churches, but he's writing to churches all the way in Italy. Uh, he has churches, and he knows about uh, churches further west as well. He is writing about churches, in, uh, writing to churches in Greece. He's writing to churches in Turkey, uh, and he's aware of a church uh, in uh, in Jerusalem. Of course, uh, he himself went to go set up churches in Arabia oh, wow. uh, and in Damascus mm-hmm. and so forth. He talks about these things. Um, we don't have letters to those specific churches, but he he did try to evangelize these areas. So he was he was spreading himself, spreading stuff around. And Paul refers to a lot of other apostles that were going around doing this as well. So. His churches aren't even the main churches. They're just the ones that we just happen to have letters that he wrote to because they were churches he was closely connected with and they had particular problems that he wrote letters about and then later Christians just happened to preserve those letters. So there must have been more churches than that by far. And we know it would have been impossible for them not to have been in Egypt. Uh, So we know, and there's some evidence that there were Christians already evangelizing in Egypt. So that's Africa, so that's a third continent. And, and it spread even further than that, already by the 50s, just in 20 years. Now, these churches would have been relatively small. I mean, probably each church maybe had 20 to 100 members, perhaps. Uh, and their stratification socially would be would reflect the general society. So there would be wealthy members and poor members. Uh, and, and that's clear from the writings of Paul, where he's, he's dealing with 
conflicts between elite values and, and common values within his churches. So there are factions growing based, uh, surrounding these, uh, these aspects. Um, Dale Martin wrote a good book uh, on the Corinthian correspondence where he talks about the evidence in those letters of the class battles within Paul's churches. So they, they span the whole gamut. Oh, is there is the Roman Empire? Um, it's very heterogeneous. I mean, did they did they care about all these spreading religions, or are they wanting to really enforce state religion, um, or is no. there a state religion? Yeah, but, no. The, well, there were there were tons of state religions, but but the way politics and religion interacted in the Roman Empire is radically different than it became under the Christian tenure in the Middle Ages and then in the modern world. Uh, for the Romans, a state religion wasn't something that you mandated everybody follow. A state religion was just something the state funded and maintained. Okay. And they would fund and maintain lots of these religions, and you didn't have to participate. It was just something that the Romans did through as a propaganda vehicle, as a way of promoting certain social goals and institutions and things. Um, and they allowed lots of other, they allowed total religious freedom, basically. Uh, the points where religious freedom became restricted were places where religious freedom started to encroach on political and social fears. And, and the two of those are witchcraft. Um, so uh, sorcery was okay as long, unless you weren't cursing people. Uh, astrology was okay as long as you weren't um, doing the, casting the horoscopes of emperors. That was considered treasonous. Uh, so the, the That's kind, awesome. It was considered you're, you're trying to look at political realities, and they don't want, they don't, that starts to look too political and not really religious anymore. Uh, and similarly with with uh, with curse magic and stuff, because that could cause riots if the the illiterate masses revolt. So the government did have some interest in policing that. But even even then, they weren't doing Salem style witch hunts in the same way Christians later did. But they did they were interested in sort of keeping the public calmed down in that regard. But the Christians, the Romans, never had a problem with Christians based on their religion. Uh, the problem the Romans always had with Christians, and it was only sporadic and occasional was always political, and, and this has to do with one of the fundamental things in the Roman Empire, which we take for granted today in, in America that we have in our Constitution explicitly written in the Bill of Rights that we have the right of assembly. Um, now, we often take for granted, like, why is that even in there? Well, it's in there because that's weird. Uh, normally, that people did not have that right, mm -hmm. and so we had to actually put it in the Constitution to create this new phenomenon, this radical idea that people have the right to gather together and, and petition the government for, with their grievances. I mean, that's, that's a radical anti-government political notion. So we had to put it in the Constitution. It normally would never, that was never the case. It was usually illegal to engage in political assembly of any kind. And even any kind of assembly was a little suspicious because it could get political at any moment. Right. Uh, so, uh, so the Romans are very big on this. And we have lots of examples of this. We have the correspondence of Pliny when he governed Bithynia, which is northern Turkey where this was a big issue, and, and, and basically the, the rule was you could not have a social club of any kind without a license from the government. So the government had to license you, and you had to jump through certain hoops to convince them that this wasn't a political club and that you were loyal to the, the emperor and this, you weren't going to do anything treasonous. So, wow. and, and if they were so suspicious of this, they could even get to the point, and this was a problem, this growing problem that Pliny the Younger wrote about, wrote a letter to the emperor saying, you know, you're, you're not even issuing licenses. And this is weird for where he was. It, normally this wasn't the case in the empire, but the emperor wasn't issuing licenses for fire brigades. And the fire brigades were basically clubs of people that would get together and their responsibility was when a fire broke out, they would all rush there and put out the fire. Christians were officially persecuted from time to time and only sporadically. It wasn't, the government didn't set out to go kill the Christians. Only, the only time the government ever interfered with Christians is when they thought they were getting too clubby and they were worried that this was an, it wasn't licensed and so and they're still getting together and we're telling them that's illegal, you're not supposed to gather together and they still gather together to do their worship. That looks like subversive behavior. So, so the Romans were seeing this as possible uprising, possible political club behavior. And so they, this is the way they were punishing it was violating the law against assembly. So it wasn't even about religion for the Romans. Even when their tests were religious, the purpose of those tests was to prove allegiance to the emperor. It wasn't really about religion. It wow. was about politics. No doubt. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that, that was the reality of Rome. But other than that, other than you know, their political oppression, oppressiveness, the Romans were extremely permissive religiously. They, they, religious freedom was, and intellectual freedom, incidentally, was very fundamental. There was, uh, 
you know, as, as long as you didn't step on political toes, you could advocate any belief you wanted. Right. Um, and, and, and that was way more so than, like, even ideology became politicized in the Middle Ages, and now it is in the modern era. It, it hadn't been in antiquity. In, in the Roman Empire, poli- it only got political when you started talking about killing the emperor or God killing mm-hmm. the emperor or something like that. You know, you had to be really explicit in your subversiveness uh, before what you were saying intellectually became a political problem. Generally, though, you could be an atheist, you could be whatever you wanted. Uh, you could advocate all kinds of beliefs. There's a great deal of freedom in that respect. Um, it was really the Christians in the Middle Ages that put a stop to that. <laughs> no, that much different than today. You can say what you want until it threatens the government, right? That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really what it goes, how it goes. You're listening to the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. You can uh, like us on Mixler.com, and please do that. Also, tweet us live at Mythicist, M-K-E. That's Mythicist, M-K-E. I have a question for Dr. Richard Carrier, esteemed guest tonight. And we had a small glitch there in the uh, in the recording. We apologize to our listeners. We are back online there. So if you had a 25-second uh, gap there, um, sorry about that. Um, that wasn't God speaking to you. It was uh, just a small technical <laughs> malfunction. I uh, have a question from a, uh, t- a tweeter uh, who asks, uh, from Chapter 10, would like you to expound upon the the relationship between, and forgive me, Eugnostos, the blessed, and the wisdom of Jesus Christ. You got something for us there? Yeah. Oh, you just want me to talk about that? In yeah, we Twitter would like to, uh, this is uh, from at God is Nowhere. Yeah, um, it's one of the interesting stories that we have. Um, according to the, as best we can tell, and, and there have been some scholars who have challenged the narrative on this, but as best we can tell, the Nag Hammadi codices, these were, Uh, a pot full of documents. These documents were transcribed in the 4th, 5th, 6th century AD, and they were all swept into a pot and buried. Um, The presumption is, because they're all very heretical, anti-Orthodox Christian documents, the the hypothesis is that the Orthodox Church was coming to wipe them out, and so they just grabbed all of this stuff on their shelf and desk and swept it into the pot and buried it to preserve it, and it sat there for 2,000 or you know, 1,500 years and was recovered in the 40s, uh, 1940s. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that they clearly were in such a rush that they actually were in the middle of creating a forgery and just swept all the evidence of that into the pot <laughs> along with everything else. Uh, and it's the cool thing is that we have the, the, their source document is the Eugnostos document in which a man named Eugnostos uh, just pontificates. He's just basically, it, it's kind of like a letter. It's written like an epistle where he's just pontificating his weird doctrines. And it appears, it doesn't even look Christian. It looks like it might be some form of um, pre-Christian Jewish Gnosticism or something hmm. unusual like that. Uh, there's nothing explicitly Christian about it. And what the, the Nag Hammadi people were doing is that they were creating, they were right, basically inventing their own gospel. And they were, they were taking the words of Eugnostos putting them on the mouth of Jesus and surrounding it with narrative where Jesus is interacting with disciples in a resurrection narrative. So they're basically creating a resurrection story where Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, but all the words are coming from this Eugnostos text. And you can see they're like halfway through creating this forgery. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just really illustrates where these things come from. Uh, that's a classic example of how they were inventing Jesus tradition they were using a source, but it wasn't Jesus as a source. It was something completely else, and they were just using Jesus as the authority mouthpiece through which to communicate the things they wanted to communicate. So this is just, I think this is how all the Gospels were created. They were basically just inventing stuff that they wanted Jesus to have said and done and to use that to illustrate the Gospel. That's 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 really interesting, and then again, the the myth seems to accrete and and build, and I just I want to kind of rewind a little bit. You had mentioned, um, you know, the in the some I think of it with Zachariah or then the Pesher and John, yeah, uh, that you were one of the pieces you mentioned was an atonement for sins, and to, to, does that mean the concept of hell, or is that coming from the Zoroasters uh, or both? Because so I want to kind of what yeah. did you mean by atonement, and and where did this conception of hell really come from? Is that also a, a oh, mythos? Yeah. Those are very different things. Because to give you an example, um, there really isn't any evidence in the authentic letters of Paul that Paul believed in a hell. 
Um, the Jews are very div diverse in their views on this. Some believed in an afterlife, some didn't. Some believed in resurrection, some didn't. Some believed in, in heaven and hell. Some only believed in a heaven. Some only believed in a heaven that would exist in the future. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a great deal of diversity about this. And when you look at the letters of Paul, it does not appear that he believed that there was any sort of eternal life for the damned. It looks like his view was you just ceased to exist. You just didn't get to live again uh, if you were damned. Whereas people who were saved would get would, would sleep, they would just be asleep in the earth, and they would be resurrected in the great end days, and then you'd get to live immortally forever in the new resurrection body God gave you. Uh, and so that was, their, that was Paul's idea, I think, uh, the best we can tell. Now, of course, once we get to the Gospels, we start to see Christian authors of those Gospels clearly believe in some sort of eternal torment hell based thing and that did come from there were Jews who believed in that too it wasn't a Christian innovation they just borrowed it from certain Jews and it does go back to Zoroastrianism the whole idea of an eternal fiery torment uh, is a Zora Persian Zoroastrian idea it comes from Iran uh, and it was infiltrated Judaism during the exile uh, when, when the Jews were uh, ultimately the, the Jews were in exile and the Persians came and conquered and the Persians were the ones that allowed the Jews to resettle their holy land uh, but they were so heavily under the influence of the Persian Zoroastrianism at that time that that's where the Jews got the idea of resurrection. Mm -hmm. That was originally a Zoroastrian idea. It was never a part of Judaism before that. Uh, so in addition to the resurrection, the idea of good versus evil, the idea of Satan being the enemy of God, all of these things were borrowed from Zoroastrianism plus the burning hell idea. But not all Jews adopted these things. Just certain ones did. So the Zoro so that, that's that aspect of it. The, the Zoroastrian hell, the Zoroastrian hell also contained a a devil. That that concept went together, or, or are they separate? Yes. Uh, well, yes. There was the evil god who was uh, battling the good god. In the Zoroastrian scheme, the hell the, the hell wasn't eternal because it would be completely annihilated in the end times. Um, but there were the Jews when they borrowed this idea, they ad they created their own adaptations of it. Um, hmm. So. Uh, the idea of atonement, however, is, is a different thing that, that inter intersected with all these different theologies that the Jews had. The basic idea being that if you wanted to be one of these lucky ones who would get resurrected and live forever, regardless of your beliefs in hell, uh, you needed to have your sins cleaned. You needed to be, have your slate cleaned in terms of your sins. And this was not just a Jewish idea. This was pretty universal. The pagans had this idea. Even the Zoroastrians had something similar uh, with, uh, regarding this. And so the Jewish scheme, which is you see in the Old Testament with the Levitical laws and all, all this, mm -hmm. is that you had to engage in animal blood sacrifices to assuage God's anger, and he would basically blot out your sins or cancel your sins. But it only lasted a short time. Uh, the, the Yom Kippur, the big one that would cleanse all of Israel of its sins, only lasted a year. Uh, so the Christians came up with the idea, well, if you... You know, that's with goat blood. Goat blood doesn't have the same magical power that God blood does. So let's, let's get a God. We'll have him be sacrificed in our scheme. And if that happens, then we don't need the temple anymore because obviously God blood would be so powerful that it, wouldn't, it would last forever. We don't need to keep repeating it year after year. So that, that was the Christian idea of it. It was basically just riffing off of Judaism and in a particular way that eliminated the Jewish temple cult from relevance. Uh, this is the key thing. The key innovation the Christian sect of Jews developed was this idea that we no longer need to worry about the, the temple cult. We've got Jesus. He replaces all the functions of the temple cult. And that was what Jesus was created for. That's his whole function. He, he serves no other function, really. Uh, even in terms of his teachings, his teachings are just ways to help you conduct your church independently of the temple. So uh, that was the whole idea of it. So, so atonement makes sense in that sense, whether we believe in hell or not. And it's really an adaptation of the primitive thinking of religion of the time, but in particular the Jewish mindset. Wow. I mean, and yeah, I, I suppose what deity doesn't like the smell of burning goat, right? Um, yeah, or or having you sprinkle blood on his on his furniture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it sounds like too that I mean, moving back, if if the Romans were sheepish, so sheepish about gatherings that they were worried about, you know, a meeting of firemen. I mean, you've got. You know, a society or a government that's really worried about insurrection. That certainly goes against the narrative of the martyrs um, that that is kind of traditionally taught, at least in Orthodox oh, yeah. Catholicism. Is that is that part of <laughs> mythos? Does that grab some from some previous myths too, like, like Saint Stephen and and some others? Yeah. Uh, well, 
Stephen's a case unto himself, but in the the general broad phenomenon of martyrology, these stories about martyrs, um, those were myths, and they had certain social political functions, but they're they're mythological. Um, uh, Candida Moss, who's a professor of biblical studies at uh, Notre Dame, she wrote a book, I think <laughs> called The Myth of Martyrdom or something like that. Uh, but you just look for Candida Moss, it's her latest, biggest book, uh, where she argues this. She points out that, no, these were myths. These things never happened. They, they sort of hugely and absurdly exaggerate minor sporadic incidents that had other, other causes and functions. Uh, so, so, yeah, the, the whole martyrdom myth idea is, was more of a propaganda type thing rather than something that really reflects what was happening in the Roman Empire. Not that there weren't persecutions, but those persecutions did not center really about religion. They were more about political fears. They were more about Christians not cooperating with Roman law um, and, and these kinds of aspects of it. Okay. Would, would um, Paul you, have known about St. Stephen or the gospel writers? Or when, when, does, when did these... Yes. Okay, so they're pretty no, early on. Oh, you're, no, no, you're, you're talking about Stephen. Yes, yeah, Stephen's oh. a different story. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the martyrdom story of Stephen is in the book of Acts. Uh, and it's a peculiar story. It's weird that he's the only one who's executed. Uh, even though Peter is the leader of the church and he's publicly preaching, he's even on trial multiple times, and he never gets stoned. Uh, the book of Acts is illogical in this respect. But Stephen somehow, this completely minor, insignificant figure, he's the one who gets uh, stoned for blasphemy or something like that. Right, he's it's the very, first martyr. It's very unclear what the actual legal procedure is. Uh, I think the story is a myth. I don't think it really happened. Okay. And, but even the word Stephen means crown. Uh, so even his name is symbolic because the idea that the martyrs would be crowned in heaven, uh, I mean, right there, it's kind of a giveaway that this is a, a, a generic martyrdom tale. It's like he's a character representing an ideal. He's not really anything. Okay. Um, and, and in a sense, it's, it's an, a replication of the, the narrative, the myth, in a sense. Just like, you know, Fox News and stuff have, the, have these myths of the conservative martyrs of people who, you know, all the bureaucracy destroyed my business. You know, they always have some sort of mythic tale. And then you go investigate and you find out that it was the, real, the reality was a much different story than what they actually are claiming. But they will build this mythology about that that will support their ideology. Uh, the same thing is happening here. We're borrowing the idea of the persecution of the prophets, because this is a, a famous Old Testament idea that the Jewish elite didn't like prophets when prophets were speaking against the Jewish elite, and so they would persecute them and kill them. <laughs> and you have references to this in, in the New Testament. Uh, and so the idea of the Christian martyrs was an idea to sort of co-opt this narrative because the, the general public actually valorized these, these prophets who were martyred by the, the elite, right? So because they were men of the people, they were sort of advocating on behalf of justice, social justice, the elite shut them down, uh, and so that made the elite unpopular among the masses. Okay. So much so that we have we have examples of rabbis talking about how uh, you know if they were ever caught alone by a commoner, the commoner would beat the crap out of them. Uh, there, there was this kind of serious class resentment because of this. And so, if the Christians wanted to have popular appeal, they wanted to co-opt this narrative of this, of this, this heroism of these martyrs. Oh, look. The elite is punishing us, therefore we must be on your side, therefore you should get with us. It's kind of that sort of structure, and there's other aspects of it uh, in terms of how to sell the gospel in that, in that way. So the martyrdom tales serve the same function. Uh, basically, it's just a way of saying, yeah, see, we're just like you guys, we're advocates for your social justice issues. Look, the, uh, the elite keeps killing us, so clearly that's, that's the badge of honor that confirms that we're actually on your side and not on the side of the elite. Yeah, Led Zeppelin uh, so, had it wrong. This is an express elevator to heaven, right? Not a yeah, stairway. Well, of course, and there, right, and that was the other aspect of it was if it's going to be difficult for you to do something so countercultural as join our movement, but the people who suffer the most get the biggest rewards, trust us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was just a way to get people to dismiss the hardships that they would have to uh, endure um, in, in the same way that religions have always done, right? It's like, fight our wars for us and you will be martyred and you'll go to heaven. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this has been, Christians were teaching this. This isn't an Islamic idea. This is a Christian mm -hmm, idea. Sure. The Muslims just borrowed it. Uh, so uh, this has always been the case in terms of how to get people to do things um, that are counter to their interests. You just try to sell them on it being really in their interests. You're listening to the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. It's 7.40. You know what time it is, Brian? I think it's the myth of the day. Myth right. of the day, <laughs> day, day, day. Take it away, Antonio. So this myth comes from, was Christianity too improbable to be false? Uh, this is one of 
Richard Carrier's <laughs> blogs. Inanna, the queen of heaven, was the most important goddess of the Sumerian pantheon in ancient Mesopotamia. She is a goddess of love, fertility, and war. Known as the goddess of love and queen of heaven, she is a hero that died at the hands of elite conspirators in order to gain this ultimate power. Inanna descends through the seven gates of hell with a different encounter at each stage. In hell, she is stripped, humiliated, and crucified. After her crucifixion in hell, she was resurrected. Inanna herself was dead for three days and three nights. Her resurrection took place during a full moon. Fascinating. Thank you, Antonio. We're talking to Dr. Richard Carrier, of course, the the headliner of the up-and-coming inaugural Myth Information Conference, which we are yeah. hosting here uh, in Milwaukee on April 25th. Get your tickets at uh, Eventbrite, available through the link at mythicistmilwaukee.com. How many uh, people are coming up uh, with your contingent, Richard? Oh, uh, you, you, no one's coming with me. Yeah, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. <laughs> Fill in seats. You're He's got 20. three armed guards, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're wondering how many tickets we no, can count uh, on. I, yeah, no, no. I, I'll, I'll be by myself. I'll buy my sad lump them. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, you don't have like twelve apostles coming with you? Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I. Yeah. I, I hear about these. Like Aaron Raw has entourage, and I guess <laughs> you're joking. Uh, it should be twelve. Um, it should no, be twelve. I, I would feel weird about an entourage. I mean, the, the the most I would come with would be a girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> well, she she is more than welcome um, uh, to come as well. <laughs> Yeah, that we're we're definitely yeah. looking forward to it. Um, these conferences are always fun. Live, you'll have a chance afterwards to talk privately to um, ask a yeah. question if we didn't get it in, and hang out, drink some beers, and have some fun. Yeah, you bet. I'm looking forward to that. And we're in the middle of a sick uh, black hole of secularism, as as Sean likes to call it here in Milwaukee. It's almost like a chunk of the Bible Belt got shot into <laughs> northern orbit up here. That's really just <laughs> steeped in in Catholicism and Lutheranism and and, and this mm. new age. Uh, evangelism that we see popping up on these prairie churches everywhere so there's really a need and uh we uh we're, we're sure looking forward to you uh coming and illuminating the uh the crowds here it, i wanted to get get kind of back into the the meat of it as is you know more more of a teaser we we mentioned that seven of these epistles seem to be genuine is there a, do you have any like a, a classic example of of one that we know that is clearly forged and why and that might be central to Christianity in some way um, that, that you like, you know, to prove that you feel like it's the, you know, the most evidential and, and the best example. Uh, of a forgery in the New Testament? Yes. Um, well, that would be 1 Timothy is a classic example of that. Um, at all of us, certainly I have to say 2 Peter is also a good one, but uh, no, 1 Timothy especially, I... Um, because what they have, the, the, the letters to Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, are claimed to be written by Paul. He's supposedly writing to his, his friend Timothy, who, who probably was an actual person who knew Paul. It was according to the authentic letters of Paul. Although this letter was never actually written to Timothy. I mean, it's all, it's all fake. Um, and we know this for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the key ones is that the authorial style of the Timothy letters is radically different than Paul's. I mean, it, it, every single stylistic element of it does not agree. Um, so it's clearly someone else who's writing this and not Paul, but, but also the ideology of it is radically different. Um, it's misogyny in particular. Uh, and Paul is often maligned as being a, a infamous misogynist uh, because he's um, basically attributed with this letter so people don't know it's a forgery. When you look at the actual letters of Paul, and there's even an interpolation in 1 Corinthians 14 where someone tried to insert some of this misogyny into one of his own letters. But we also we have evidence confirming that that's an interpolation. He did not write it. Uh, but also because it contradicts what he wrote earlier in the same letter. Paul himself was much more of an egalitarian. Uh, not a total mm. egalitarian, but he was trending more in the, the direction of women and men being equals. Um, not fully, but, but it was much more so. And he certainly allowed women to speak out in church. Women could be prophets in his church. Uh, so women could receive communications and, and communicate them to the community, and they, that would be treated with the same authority as anyone else. So women had a bigger place or role to play in his churches. Now, when we get to the second century, the church was so large and institutionalized, it did not like this egalitarianism. It did not like giving women positions of power. So it adopted more of the sexist uh, attitude of hierarchy, where women needed to shut up, men needed to be in charge. Uh, and 1 Timothy is one of these letters that was forged in, in defense of this new paradigm. 
Oh, okay. And so it has the it has the famous passage in it where it has it depicts Paul saying, you know, suffer not a woman to preach, teach, or have authority over a man, uh, because Eve was in the tra- transgression, not Adam, and so on. So this is basically it's all on the the original sin story. This is not Paul, but this is this was Christians who were actually trying to push this narrative of women can't teach, women can't have positions of authority anymore, and Paul said so, and they forged a whole letter to make Paul say so, uh, and that it had biblical support. So they invented this this argument from the Genesis narrative. Uh, so that that to me is a classic example, not only from a historical perspective, because we have a stylistic analysis, we have the ideological analysis. Uh, so we know it's a forgery, and we know it was distorting the teachings of Christianity. Uh, it's significant because it shows that the New Testament is not consistent, and therefore it's not reliable in terms of its moral teachings. It became more and more immoral over time, and actually started advocating misogyny and sexism as the as righteousness within the sect, and that was not what was going on in Paul's church uh, originally. Uh, but uh, also, I mean, it, it, it shows that Christianity as a whole just as a, from a theological perspective, is bankrupt. It clearly is not the one true religion, because we know these misogynistic, sexist attitudes are false. We know if you had a main line, a true, if you were having real communications with the Holy Spirit or God, he would tell you that. So we know the people writing the New Testament, because they wrote this document, were not talking to God, did not have a main line to the Holy Spirit, were not aware of what was morally true. Uh, so it kind of, that one document being placed in there destroys the whole Christian religion. It proves that it is a false religion uh, with immoral doctrines, um, even apart from the historical aspect of it, just from the, theolo- the theological aspect of it. So that's one of my favorite forgeries. Right. It certainly so shows the seed of doubt, because we often see, you know, Scripture being cite- cited for the, you know, moral mm-hmm. course of actions. And if you're citing something yeah. that's clearly just a political document, um, you know, from 200 AD. Yeah, yeah, this this is not source of morality. This is just a political maneuver, you know, 1800 years ago. That, that's that's yeah. that's really good. <laughs> I think and that's that's why we're here is to is is for people to just take a skeptical look at this, you know, I'm not saying be an atheist, just take mm-hmm. a skeptical look at your texts. Yeah, yeah, just just don't buy this as the book of God, whatever your religious belief ends up being. This is clearly not coming from any kind of moral Authority. It's coming from fallible, sexist humans from 1,800 years ago. Right. Um, and that's it. You, you really shouldn't be organizing your life around that. Certainly. Yeah, in the same way that priests aren't allowed to be married is simply a cultural construct from around 700 as, as a separation of powers. Right. This is not yeah. divine. This is not being married to God. This is a, a, a 1,300-year-old <laughs> cultural construct. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Explain to me the concept of, or the difference between the hypothesis of history and the hy- hypothesis of myth, if you would. Oh, uh, in terms of explaining the origins of Christianity with or without Jesus, right? Yeah. Right, I, outside of its divinity. Yes, yes, just from the secular perspective. Um, generally, I mean, there are, there are actually like a dozen, at least a dozen different hi- hypotheses of historicity. Um, in fact, there are inability to decide among them is a big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I talk about that in Proving History. But if you were to sort of look for the most generic, what they all have in common. Uh, what they all have in common is the basic hypothesis that, and I talk about this in, on the historicity of Jesus as, as minimal, mythici- or minimal historicity, uh, which is this view that Jesus was, was just an ordinary person. Um, he might have been charismatic. He inspired a lot of people. Uh, and in such a way that when he got himself killed, People sort of tried to rationalize that and keep his religion and his teachings going by basically deifying him, by saying he was resurrected by God and he was appointed to be God's Lord and, and, and Savior, and so the, the, you can organize a religion around this. And uh, a lot of secular scholars, I would say, well, all secular scholars, agree that that has to be the truth or something like that. It's, it's, it's certainly, if not the most likely, it's, it's close to the most likely explanation. Right. Reza Aslan certainly origin. says this. Yeah. Um, now, the competing view, and there's it's at least seven of us, um, like three sitting professors, um, a few retired professors, a few uh, fully qualified PhDs, uh, who have gone on public record saying that, well, maybe not. Um, maybe it's possible 
that the religion didn't begin with an ordinary guy like that, that in fact the, the founder of the religion would have been like Kephos or Peter, um, having visions of an archangel named Jesus in the same way that Muhammad had visions of the angel Gabriel or claimed to, mm -hmm. uh, the same way that Joseph Smith claimed to have conversations with the angel Moroni, so that Jesus is more like Gabriel or Moroni, and that's how the religion began. And then the idea of making Jesus into a historical character as a way to sell and create authority for the doctrines of later churches, that only arose like 40 to 50 years later, like a whole human lifetime at that. An average, uh, adult, an average adult life expectancy back then was 48 years, assuming you survived childhood. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so 50 years, that, that's, that's a human life, that's an average human lifespan. That's a long time. Um, so it was only after that span of time that people started creating these these stories of a historical man named Jesus walking around Galilee, and they created these stories to sell their particular model of the gospel, their particular idea of the teachings and the particular idea of what missionary work should be like and all of this. And that's the mythos, That's the basic mythicist hypothesis, or at least the one that's most plausible. There are a lot of ridiculous alternatives, but that's the one that has support in terms of its plausibility and in terms of its background evidence and in terms of some clues and hints and evidence for it. Um, and so those are the two theories that they're competing against each other. Which one, they're both plausible. They, they both could be true. Uh, and so the question is, which one, does, does, which one gives a better explanation of all the evidence together? And I think there's a slight favor for the mythicist hypothesis, and I show that and discuss why in On the History City of Jesus. Why do you think it was that um, you know Christianity, as as a you know fulfillment of the prophetism of, of the the Jewish cult, is the one that made it? There there were other savior type type mm -hmm. deities and religions. Why why is it Christianity the one that seems to to make it through and not something else? Well, you realize that that's statistical inevitability, right? One did a little bit of luck. To eventually, <laughs> it's it's just a random dice roll as to which one succeeded, right? Um, if you want to talk about in terms of social dynamics, like what attributes put Christianity at the forefront of the highest probability of, of succeeding, I mean, key, absolutely key, was Paul's innovation of saying, you did not have to be a Jew anymore to be a Christian. Uh, had he not done that, Christianity would have been a tiny little fringe sect. It right. would have died out. It would have been uninfluential in Western history. So it was that innovation that was key. Um, now, even then... Christianity was just one tiny, insignificant religion among hundreds of others in the Roman Empire. It was not a significant religion in that regard. It was still it was spread across three continents. It had, you know, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of adherents. The key piece of history that changed that uh, is when Constantine, who was raised and tutored by Lactantius, who was one of the most hardcore fundamentalist Christians of the time, when Constantine fought, gained, got into a position where he was fighting a civil war for control of the divided empire and reunited the Eastern and Western Empire halves, and as many emperors before him had done, they tried to they were in the third century during the age of chaos, they were trying to find some sort of state religion to organize society behind. Uh, and the pagan models were tried at first. Constantine wanted to do the same thing, to unite the two halves of the empire, to try and unite government with religion, to sort of combined forces to sort of hold the empire together uh, in these trying times, he picked Christianity because it was the one that he was raised in. Uh, he saw that Christian church spanned both halves of the empire and also his enemy, the other half of the empire, the hostile emperor and his court were anti-Christian. So it was actually advantageous politically to be pro-Christian in order to basically root out who his real enemies were hmm. in the eastern half of the empire. So it was a smart political move, and it was just a happenstance of history that Christianity just happened to be positioned in this place at that time. It could have been any other religion. It just happened to be Christianity as a hidden, random historical contingency. Wow. So how politics we get so play lucky? into it again. Wow. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I wondered how we got so lucky. We ended up getting stuck with Christianity. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, uh, the emperors, even before that, the pagan emperors in the Age of Chaos, which is the 3rd century, we're, we're becoming increasingly fascistic. I mean, they're hardcore fascistic mm -hmm. uh, governments. And when Constantine took over Christianity, made it the state religion, Constantine was even more fascist. And so, in fact, he sort of turned Christianity into a tool of fascism, which it, became, which it remained for another, like, 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. It really was just a vehicle for fascism. 
uh, and um, and often unsuccessful at that. But under Constantine and his successors, it was fairly successful at that. In this age of distress, as you call it, um, and, and just for perspective, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is yeah. that the, the, the Huns from the, uh, the Russian steppes are moving westward, displacing all kinds of other barbarian tribes in front of them, and they're all coming into contact with the Roman Empire. Is, is that what's going on politically? No, no. I mean, I mean, yes, things like that were going on, but that was not a threat to the empire. That, that was easily dispatched. The Roman Empire was fully capable of taking that on. That was not even really a problem. Um, what was what was the problem? And the age of chaos is the third century. Uh, it started 235 A.D. It ended about 275 A.D. Between those two years, so it's about 50 years, 40 or 50 years of nothing but constant civil war. There were actually in those that that period there were actually 40 emperors. That's how uh, unstable the empire was. The empire was often not unified during this period. It divided and split and reunited and stuff. So imagine, and then at the end of that, by the way, at 275 the fiduciary economy collapsed. So imagine, uh, for, through, through other reasons, because there, there, are, there are lots of explanations in terms of economic policy as to why that happened, but imagine if the American Civil War lasted 50 years, <laughs> not five, Yeah. and then at the end of it, you had the Great Depression. Now imagine how fucked over the United States would be. I mean, and, and, and the response that the, the, that the Romans had was the same that the Germans had in, in the Weimar Republic when, when the Great Depression affected them. They right after the fascist. war. Yep. Yeah, yeah. They, well, they went fascist, right? So, yes. so that's what the Romans did. They went, to, they went hardcore fascist. They did all the wrong things economically. They put on price controls, draconianly enforced price controls to try and fix things. Um, it was a disaster. But during this 50-year period when, when the Civil War was going on, and then, of course, the, the Depression was even worse when it ended it, the vast loss of institutions, of economic resources, of uh, social capital, intellectual capital, was profound. The, the blow to the Roman Empire, the injury, was mortal. Uh, it was just, the Roman Empire could just sort of limp along after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so when we're talking about the barbarians at the gates, the only reason those started to disintegrate the empire is because the empire was already dying. It had already basically shot itself in the heart with this, you know, tremendous act of destruction that, that just sort of annihilated all of the social and political and economic resources the empire had in that third century. Uh, and so everything after that was just an attempt to try and hang on desperately. And, and, you know, that was increasingly fascistic efforts were made to try to do that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what we're talking about. And that's the environment in which Christianity became ascendant, gained political power. And so it, it gained political power solely as a tool of fascism to sort of escape this age of, of despair and chaos and ruin. Okay, I had this age of chaos. Yeah, I did a little bit. Thanks for dating that for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, it, Attila yeah. And the, it comes much, much later. So, okay, by that yeah, point, yeah. you said, yeah, they've been were, mortally wounded. other... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were lots of other, there were many waves of barbarian invasions trying to hit the borders, but the Romans were always capable of handling that. It was just after this third century sequence of events that Rome basically, just the wind was kicked out of it and it could no longer support the efforts that it used to be able to do to maintain its borders. And, and that, then, you know, barbarians could start dismantling things. All right. So their, their failure to have any kind of like emperor succession kind of really, it, it influences the development of Christianity. And I think that's what we're saying. History is yeah. influencing the religion directly. Oh, totally. Yes, definitely. We have a minute left. Uh, we are talking to Dr. Richard Carrier. He will be our special guest speaking at the Myth Information Conference on April 25th here in Milwaukee. He's got a new book. You got a minute, Doc. Plug your new book once more. Sure. Um, on the Historicity of Jesus, uh, published by the University of Sheffield. You can find it on my website at richardcarrier.info. Um, Amazon, got dot com too. Get it there. It's, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you buy it, well, it, I sell through Amazon, so if you buy it through my website, I get a commission as well as the royalty. Go to the um, website. But, uh, Go to his website. But yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's print. It's available in Kindle. It also just came out in audiobook, read by me. So, uh, this would many be great. Formats. Listen in your car on your way to work, maybe after a couple yeah. weeks. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks, and uh, we will yeah. continue this fascinating discussion. To, yeah, I'm looking forward to it, too. All right. Take care. Thanks, Doc. You bet. All right. Next week, James Kirk Wall. This has been the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. Good night, everybody.